five years ago, I used to work for one of the biggest banks in Uganda as an accountant. And that meant that I was away from my family for long periods of time. In 2009, after six months without going home, I took off time from my daily work to go and visit my family. But on my way home, I met my kid sister carrying a huge band of firewood on her head on the day she was supposed to be in school. And when I saw her, at first I didn't get surprised because I also carried wood as a kid. But when she saw me, instead of being happy, she started crying. And she cried so hard that at first I thought maybe she was overwhelmed with joy because I hadn't been home for six months. <laughs> but as I continuously came closer, she even cried harder, and I was confused. I thought maybe a snake had beat her, or my mother was terribly sick. So I got really concerned. But when I helped her put the wood down, and we sat for a few minutes, with tears still rolling down her beautiful face, she told me that she was crying because she couldn't attend school, because she had to miss school twice a week to walk for six miles to go and gather wood for my family. So I told her, Stop crying, let's go home. And I gave her a promise that I would try to convince my mother to allow me to take her back with me to the city and find her a school where she didn't have to gather wood. But when I proposed that to my mother, she said, are you out of your mind? I live here alone with your sister. She's the only one that helps. I'm an old woman. Do you want me to be the one going out in the field to gather this wood? And as you see, our village no longer has any forest, so we have to continuously either buy the wood in the market when we don't have money, walk as far as we can to gather some free wood. So that failed. I went back to my normal job in the city, but my life was totally changed. I kept having nightmares about my sister because I'm a strong believer in education. I wouldn't be here if I didn't go to school. So seeing my sister on the verge of missing the only opportunity she had to improve her life really hit me hard. So I decided to make uh, research about this, but I was an accountant. I didn't know anything about energy or anything. So I decided to do research, and what I discovered shocked me. First, I discovered that my own country, Uganda, had already lost 75% of its forests. And the UN uh, said that in, uh, uh, by the year 2030, Uganda would have no forest left. That really got me concerned. But I, I discovered more things. I discovered that indoor air pollution associated with people using charcoal and firewood kills more people than HIV AIDS tuberculosis, and malaria combined. This is killing so many people, and we can't let that continue to happen. I also discovered that actually, because all the forests are gone, people have to spend up to 40% of their incomes on cooking fuel alone. And these are people who live on very little money. So when there is no money to buy food and fuel, they have to skip meals. Some have to only eat one meal to keep alive. So with all this information, I couldn't just continue with my luxury life, luxurious life with a comfortable job. So I decided to do something. I was confused at first what I would do as an accountant, but then I asked myself, if no one really tries, who will? So I quit my job with just $500 in savings and embarked on a journey to try and find a solution to this problem. And I'm happy to tell you today that we actually found a solution. Our solution, our solution is a simple product called green charcoal. Green charcoal is a premium sort of charcoal made out of agricultural waste, things like sugarcane waste, coffee husks, uh, corn waste. In a country like Uganda, where 85% of the population depends on agriculture, there's a lot of waste that no one uses for anything. They just burn it and oh, it pollutes the environment. So that is what we collect and convert into a product that people can use instead of depleting forests. And here is the real deal. Our fuel is 65% cheaper currently, and so we have a lot of room to increase our prices. It burns cleaner and burns longer and can be used in any stove that people currently use. So people don't have to invest in a new stove. That makes it easy to adapt. But the most exciting part is that our, our, our solution is based on a simple, innovative, and inclusive business model. 
A business model begins with uh, farmers. We work with farmers, provide them with a kiln. A kiln is a simple technology that we developed. We teach them how to convert their waste into a product called char. We then buy this char from them and compress it into briquettes. And we've created a network of women micro retailers that sell it back to the communities that use it. But here is the real deal. Everyone wins in the process. Currently, we work with 2,500 farmers. Each of them is able to increase their incomes by over 50%. We have created a network of 460 women micro retailers who are able to increase their incomes by over 80%. And currently, we reach over 20,000 households on a daily basis. <laughs> and our biggest problem now, our biggest problem now is that demand exceeds our supply. People have started knowing about the product, and uh, we are working hard with the team to ensure that we increase our production capacity so that in about 10 years, everyone, every household in sub-Saharan Africa that needs fuel can have access to clean and affordable fuel. Therefore, if you care about stopping global deforestation, if you care about reducing CO2 emissions, if you care about reducing the number of people who die every day because of Indawa air pollution, I invite you to come talk to me after this. Visit our website, come to Uganda, find out how you can work with us, and together we shall change the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>